morning, everyone. Welcome to Build Day 3. Our session is called Coding Enterprise Apps. And we're going to be talking about Microsoft Intune, more specifically related to the Intune Graph APIs alongside the in Microsoft Intune App Protection Policy SDK. My name is Asavri Navathe. And I'm a program manager uh, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, t with me, I have Kyle, who's a software engineer on my team, and Dave Randall, who's a senior program manager based here in Redmond as well. So in terms of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about some of the integration areas available with Microsoft Intune, go into the client uh, app SDK, and Kyle's going to do a demo about how to use our SDK for your Xamarin apps and um, uh, the resultant uh, policies that get applied as a benefit of doing this, the, doing this work. Uh, and Dave's going to go into some automation and data access uh, via the gra Microsoft Graph. So Intune is basically a mobile device management software, and we also do mobile application management. So we have a bunch of integrations that uh, you can uh, take advantage of, including uh, checking for device compliance, telecom exp ex uh, expense management, mobile threat defense. We partner with uh, three, uh, three popular vendors in the industry in order for uh, you as an IT admin to get um, the benefits uh, of these uh, MTD uh, vendors al alongside your Intune deployments, software inventory, f um, data warehouse, the Microsoft Graph API, as mentioned, and what me and Kyle are going to go into uh, is uh, app protection policies. So this is kind of an overview of what Intune integrates with. Um, basically, all of these boxes represent some APIs that you can call. Um, mobile threat defense, the partners that we integrate with are on the left over there. And uh, the Intune client app SDK uh, is currently in all the core office apps um, and all upcoming office apps, even the small, medium business ones, are looking to integrate the core, uh, the Intune app SDK in order to have kind of a container-like experience on end user devices. We're using office apps alongside any third-party apps that have the Intune SDK integrated along with uh, LOB apps that have wrapped uh, with the Intune SDK or also integrated. So I'm going to get into Microsoft Intune App SDK. So what are app uh, protection policies? Uh, basically, we're going to talk about what kind of features get enabled once you have uh, done the work to integrate the SDK. Um, alongside how you can do this, there are a couple of tools that we have offered. We have something called the Intune App Wrapping Tool which is more targeted to um, at IT admins who don't necessarily have access to the source code, um, but do have the right signing credentials in order to be able to do this. And then we have the SDK, which requires a little bit more um, uh, access to the uh, source code and a little bit more work, um, alongside the Xamarin bindings, which are specifically targeted to Xamarin-based uh, Xamarin apps. And that's what Kyle will be demoing for us and showing the resultant um, policies that get enabled after doing this for a sample app. We're going to talk a little bit about moving forward, uh, what's coming up, and then how to contact us. Um, there's going to be a link to kind of more resources, so if you guys can maybe just take a picture of the slide, or if you're available later today, uh, come by our booth, um, and we can talk a little bit more about uh, troubleshooting or just where to learn more about what we do. So what are Intune app protection policies? So I think this diagram does a pretty good job of uh, explaining what, we, what we're trying to enable. So we're trying to uh, uh, protect and se separate corporate apps, data, and identities from personal ones. So for apps like Word, um, Excel, and PowerPoint, which have the multi-identity concept, we tie any uh, corporate app protection policies to the corporate identity and uh, the personal data. Uh, stay separate. So you can apply selective wipes to just your corporate identity and uh, any related data on the device that's tied to that corporate identity. As I mentioned before, uh, app protection policies are built into Microsoft Office and productivity apps. And they're built into some third party apps. I can go into kind of a quick um, uh, slide about what apps we currently have available, and we have more um, third parties interested um, in trying to uh, become a part. Uh, of the ecosystem, and you can also enable APP in your own apps, which is what we're going to talk about today as well. 
So this is just a quick overview of the app, uh, uh, APP ecosystem. So at the top we have our Microsoft apps. You can see all the core apps listed there. And then some partner apps that are also integrated with the Intune SDK. Um, typically these are the ones that have a lot of um, inter uh, interaction with the Office apps as well, uh, which is why it, it's, it's just a cleaner experience when they have app protection policies targeted to them as well. So just to give a little background on who would be using our product. So we have Steve, an IT admin, and Steve's been uh, in charge of uh, basically managing their end user devices uh, for Contoso, which is an organization that he works for. Um, and he's been in charge of applying app protection policies to his end users um, alongside the apps that the app protection policies should be applied to and the user groups which uh, should receive these policies. Um, so he's noticed that he's been able to apply to the available apps in the console today, but he's noticed that his um, own company has a lot of line of business apps that he believes would benefit from being able to transfer data from and out of um, uh, the office apps and the other apps that are currently targeted. Uh, and in order to enable this, uh, they either have to be wrapped with the Intune app wrapper or integrated with the SDK. That's where Jane comes in. Jane's an app developer. And so her job would be to enable this and pass on the um, uh, enabled um, LOB app to uh, Steve, and he can um, upload it into console, make it available, um, and finish uh, doing his targeting. So these are the tools that I mentioned. So the app wrapping tool is a command line tool available for Android and iOS. There are no code changes required to your app, and it's used, uh, it's, the, the use case is for LOB apps. If you do have an app that you want to release to the App Store, we recommend that you use the Intune App SDK. Um, it has a little bit more functionality in terms of all the multi-identity scenarios where you can um, target based off of um, the, uh, the corporate identity signed into an app. Um, and it's, it can be used for store and LOB apps. And then the last thing is the Xamarin bindings. Basically, what this is is uh, APP functionality for Xamarin-based apps. We recently released our uh, revamped Jam uh, Xamarin bindings last month for iOS and Android. Um, so if you guys are Xamarin developers and have some feedback, I know we, we talked a little bit with some of you early before the session, but we would love to hear it and try to make this experience better for you. Now that I think about it, how many of you are familiar with Intune? Just a show of hands. Awesome. And then how many of you use Intune? Super cool. Um, and then in terms of Xamarin, uh, how many of you are Xamarin developers? OK. All right. So why would your app need to be Intune enabled? Uh, mentioned this a little bit, just hoping this slide will kind of simplify things and clarify things a little bit. So your app has data that needs to be protected. Um, and your app has integration with Office applications, and in your app has a requirement not to launch on jailbroken devices. So what we do is uh, there's a couple of settings, um, such as detecting whether or not your, uh, the device that the app is being launched on is rooted or jailbroken, uh, requiring a specific minimum OS version, minimum Android patch version, or minimum app version itself before you can launch the app with that corporate identity that it's tied to. And then there's also uh, save as restrictions, uh, where you can save as save uh, documents, uh, corporate documents, only to specified locations by the IT admin. On top of some data transfer policies, where um, you can determine uh, if you can transfer data with uh, within uh, managed apps only, or uh, from managed apps or from unmanaged apps. So there's a couple of customization options there, and then also restricting cut, copy, paste from managed apps to an app like Twitter, for example. So uh, the Intune SDK can also enable these scenarios. So for our authentication, we use the uh, ADA library. Uh, and then we have some custom app configuration policies that you can use Intune Console for as well, and uh, that you do not need uh, MDM enrollment. Um, so APP policies, you do not require uh, your uh, end user's devices to be enrolled into the Intune um, uh, company portal app. Uh, and then access on-prem resources with uh, Azure App Proxy, which some of you may have heard of, and then the Citrix NetScaler integration. Um, 
that we're working on as well. So in terms of uh, using the app wrapping tool versus the SDK, I mentioned this as well, but uh, the app wrapping tool is typically used by the IT admins who um, uh, can just download this command line tool and put in uh, the required parameters, the path to the app and the signing certificate um, information, um, and you're able to kind of wrap the app and have it ready to go. Uh, in terms of the SDK, if your app is a little bit complex in functionality or if it's going to be released to the public app store for use with uh, even non Intune customers, you should be using the SDK. And then if your app supports multi-identity, all of those features you will need to use the SDK for. And then uh, if you have any custom flows that your app wants to support, and obviously we expect this to be used by the developers who are more familiar with the code. So the SDK ex exclusive features are um, multi-identity, selective wipe, which I mentioned, um, some save as controls for storage locations, Style customization, if you'd like to have an Intune badge on your app, for example. Um, some notifications, and uh, the uh, basically app config for non-enrolled devices is what the last point is trying to say. So before Kyle gets into the demo, just we would like to highlight that we released uh, what we're calling the Xamarin bindings uh, last week, or last month rather, and um, they're available for Android and iOS. And we have sample apps that uh, have released on iOS. The Android and uh, Xamarin Forms versions of our sample apps are coming shortly. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Kyle, who's going to go through a demo for us and show us uh, how to enable some app protection policies on his uh, Xamarin-based iOS app. Uh. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. How's it going, folks? Um, so uh, I'm going to be running through a demo of our uh, sample uh, Xamarin.iOS app, uh, which as of last night is now publicly available and open source on GitHub. Uh, so you can get it at github.com slash msintuneappsdk. Uh, and as Aswari mentioned, we've got uh, similar samples coming for Xamarin.android and a Xamarin Forms app, which features shared logic across Android and iOS. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, get right into it and uh, go ahead and uh, start debugging. Uh, so you'll see here our app basically just includes, uh, so uh, our Xamarin bindings are available as a NuGet package. Uh, so uh, we're just including uh, the intune.mam.xamarin.ios uh, uh, package here. Um, yeah, so uh, when the app initially launches, uh, we haven't authenticated, and so we're in an unmanaged context uh, at this point. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and run through a few scenarios here to show you guys what things look like uh, before we've enrolled and, and received app protection policies, and what happens after uh, you've enrolled, uh, and what the logic uh, to enable all of that functionality actually looks like. Um, so, uh, here we are, uh, we're in an unmanaged context. Uh, you can picture, um, oops, looks like I accidentally hit a button there. Um, and did it again. <laughs> so you can uh, picture this being potentially a corporate uh, enterprise app um, uh, that's got corporate data in it uh, and I'm just uh, uh, an individual worker at my organization, and I decide I want to copy some text out of this app uh, and maybe go into my personal messages uh, and text it to a friend of mine, or potentially go onto social media and post it or share it via that. Uh, those channels uh, might not necessarily be what <laughs> an IT uh, admin would want their end users doing with their corporate data. Um, if uh, we go ahead and hit this open URL button here uh, to launch the URL in this text box. Uh, you'll see I'm taken into Safari uh, so I can reach uh, uh, potential uh, corporate endpoints uh, in the context of an unmanaged browser that doesn't include the Intune SDK uh, or any sort of uh, app protection. Uh, again, not necessarily what an IT pro would want. Um, 
uh, if we hit this share content button, uh, you'll see here we're in a, a simulator right now, uh, so there aren't any apps available that could handle sharing text, but you can see I've got these uh, system level options available in the share UI. Um, again, uh, as a corporate uh, or as a, an IT pro, I might be a little worried about where my users are sharing their corporate data to. Um, and if I hit this file here, this button here, which uh, enables uh, saving a file locally to the device, you'll see I get this nice, this little message letting me know that uh, I was able to do that. Um, so now let's see what happens after we authenticate and enroll with the Intune MAM service uh, and get our app protection policies. Uh, and before we do that, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at what we've got set for policies for the user uh, that we're going to enroll with. Um, so you can see here, uh, we've got um, uh, we've got uh, the allow app to transfer data to other apps policy set to none, which means it should be blocked entirely. Uh, we have uh, prevent save as set to uh, yes. Uh, and we've specified that we uh, specifically want to block uh, save as to local storage. Uh, we've got restrict cut, copy, and paste uh, to policy managed apps only. Uh, we've got restrict web content to display in the managed browser, uh, which is um, uh, the managed browser is a, a um, Intune branded browser that's available uh, in the public app stores for iOS and Android, uh, which includes our SDK. Um, and so, and we've also got uh, policy uh, set to require pin, uh, although we haven't set policy uh, to require a complex pin so that I don't have to think of a complex pin on the fly for you folks. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's see what happens when we go ahead and authenticate. So let's do that. Um, and just to take a look at what that logic actually looks like. Um, so uh, here is our uh, touch up inside handler uh, for the login button. And you can see all we're doing is calling the Intune MAM enrollment manager instances uh, login, and login and enroll account API. Uh, so that's right here. Um, and basically just passing in uh, the content of the URL field, of the, um, the email field. And so we'll go ahead and hit log in, and we get this ADOL prompt. Uh, and we'll go ahead and say and enter our credentials. Um, and right now we're enrolling and pulling down our app protection policies, and we get this nice message uh, letting uh, the end user know. Uh, hey, your IT, your IT admin is now helping you protect data in this app. Um, and you see we get this nice uh, pin prompt. And as I mentioned, we're not requiring complex pin here. So we'll keep things simple. Um, and now let's see what happens when I go ahead and run through all those same scenarios. So uh, let's go ahead and try, whoops. Try paste. Oh, try pasting into a uh, unmanaged context again. Uh, so let's get rid of this here and give that a shot. You see, I'm given this uh, nice little message letting me know, hey, my organization uh, doesn't allow uh, me to paste uh, into this context. Uh, but if you remembered, we set policy to allow copy and paste between managed applications. Uh, I don't have another managed app here, but if I go back into the same app and attempt to paste, uh, you'll see I'm, I'm able to successfully do that. Uh, if I attempt to open a URL, uh, you'll see that I get prompted to go to the App Store and install the managed browser um, to help keep me in a managed context. Uh, because we're in simulator, there is no App Store here, so I'm not going to go ahead and do that. Uh, but basically, I'd be taken to the App Store, have the managed browser installed, and then navigate to the URL I open. Uh, if I go and try to share some content, you'll remember we set policy to block that entirely, so all the options get filtered out of the UI here. Um, and what's interesting about everything I've shown you guys uh, thus far, uh, we'll, let's go ahead and take a look at the code for all of it. Um, so basically, uh, none of what I just showed you, the, the pin UI, 
uh, opening a managed link or um, uh, um, uh, copy and paste required uh, or even uh, the, the share work requires the app developer to do anything at all. Uh, so you'll see here, uh, this is our, um, uh, this is our uh, URL, uh, uh, open URL button handler, and you'll see there's absolutely no Intune specific logic in here. Uh, it's all, uh, the app is basically just uh, going ahead and calling open URL on the string, uh, and basically the Intune SDK uh, handles enforcing the policy without the developer having to actually worry about it. Uh, so it's basically, uh, the developer just has to worry about implementing their app functionality and letting the Intune SDK uh, uh, handle pulling down policy and enforcing it. Uh, same thing here with the, share UI, with the share button. We're just showing a UI activity view controller. Uh, there's absolutely nothing Intune specific going on here. Uh, we don't even have to worry about checking the policy and enforcing it ourselves. Uh, copy and paste was the same thing. Uh, so yeah. Uh, now, uh, save as is one exception to the rule where uh, we actually do need uh, the app to help us enforce that. Uh, so what we do there is we actually just uh, expose the policy value uh, via our Intune Man Policy Manager's uh, um, uh, uh, instances uh, uh, is safe to allow for, uh, uh, for location. So uh, you can see here we're basically just uh, doing a simple check to see if, hey, uh, is safe to, safe to the local drive uh, blocked? Uh, uh, as you can see, so it's an is allowed call, but we're doing a not here. Um, so basically, if, it, if it's disallowed, we go ahead and just put up this alert saying, hey, sorry, not allowed. Otherwise, uh, we just go ahead and save the file locally. Uh, so pretty simple, pretty minimal investment. Uh, and as you can see here, when we go ahead and hit the save, hit the save file button, uh, we get that block message. Uh, so yeah, um, that's just a, a little rundown of an iOS app uh, built with Xamarin. Uh, uh, the, our Xamarin bindings uh, essentially have um, an equivalent C Sharp API for all the APIs available in our native SDK. Uh, so uh, there really shouldn't be uh, anything blocking you from doing uh, whatever you want to do uh, in your Xamarin binding, uh, in your Xamarin app um, uh, that you could do in a native app. So yeah, with that, I'll hand it back to Aswari. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. So as I mentioned before, uh, we, uh, as we released our first version of the Xamarin bindings last month, we expect more and more customers to adopt this, and we want to make sure we create the right experience for you guys. Uh, the sample for iOS is available already, and the Android and combined one, uh, Xamarin Forms one, is coming up. So just due to the nature of our product being an SDK for mobile apps, uh, any uh, new OS releases for uh, Android and iOS are pretty important to us. Uh, and our developers uh, spend a significant amount of time trying to figure out uh, to uh, any uh, work required to make sure that our current scenarios are still supported and if any new APIs are released that might kind of um, affect our uh, kind of container story. Uh, we make sure that that's um, being either blocked right away or managed uh, through an Intune app protection policy which was uh, basically that blade that you saw that Kyle was showing. Uh, it's available in uh, through the Intune um, blade in the Azure portal. So if you guys want more information, definitely take a picture of this slide. Um, the easiest way to find us is through that GitHub link, MS Intune App SDK. Um, and then any documentation on our Intune Docs page will definitely be linked through there. And you can just you know go on an adventure clicking through all of those things and learn a lot about our product as well. And also come find us at the um, mobile device and app security booth. Um, uh, we'll be there to talk a little bit more to you guys and really learn about how you're using Intune if you're already doing so and if we don't have time for questions at the end of this. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Dave and he's going to talk to us about the Microsoft Graph API and how to leverage that with Intune. All right. Thanks, Aswari.
So actually, what I wanted to do, because the graph side is really IT pro administrator focused, and all of the things that Aswari and Kyle have talked about are on client side or end user side app development, I wanted to take an opportunity <coughs> right now to uh, open the floor to questions for Kyle and Aswari, because the, the two aspects of this particular presentation are fairly diverse. And I know a lot of you are here for uh, app development on client side. So if there's anybody that has questions, you can go to the mics, and, uh, or we can repeat them for Aswari and Kyle. Yeah? I get a few, so maybe I can wait until the booth. But the first and most important is uh, MSAL. Uh, it seems to be a really, really uh, uh, good SSO experience for us. And that's kind of what we've been looking for. Uh, how difficult will it be to integrate MSAL with uh, into these guys are using ADAP? So let me just repeat the question. The, the question is how difficult is it to incorporate MSAL versus ADAL libraries for app development with Intune? For the SDK. For the SDK. Um, it's something we actually, we haven't investigated yet, um, uh, but I have seen questions about this come up on, on several forums. Um, so it's something I'll have to take back to our team and, and uh, we'll have to look into it. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, to be honest, I, I don't have an answer for you right at the moment, but um, I could, after the session, we could link up and I could follow up with you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, at the mic. Yeah, my just question is uh, same day support for new app updates, obviously. Um, everyone gets a new iPhone when iOS 12 comes out. So how close to Intune is the same day support for when Apple releases iOS 12 to have Intune support for your applications? Is it a week off, a two weeks off? Do you guys have any kind of guarantee that you're giving same day support for OS releases for wrapped apps? Um. In terms of uh, same day support, uh, the SDK we will be releasing uh, prior to day zero because the whole concept of, uh, for, for you guys, in order for you to see the day zero support, it requires apps to have integrated the SDK. So what we do is we work with our office teams to get an understanding of their release cadence for when they uh, will be releasing an update closest to that date and make sure that our SDK um, is ready for that scenario. And if there is any um, new APIs that um, uh, are affected by this, uh, we will release comms in a way that emphasizes, OK, like for, for, for this release, for example, in the last release we had drag and drop that was new on iOS. We'll say, hey, for this release, drag and drop is blocked. Um, the next release may not be day zero, but we will be finding a way to manage that. Um, and instructing apps to make the changes in order to make that managed. Um, for the wrapper, um, it's a little bit different. We try to aim for day zero, but I'm, I'm going to admit that it doesn't always happen. Um, but at least one sprint off, so for us it's 30 months, is some, or 30 days, is something we um, aim for. Um, and that's definitely something top of mind for us to make sure we um, accommodate for that. Is there anything? You want to add, Kyle? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Nothing else? All right. Let's uh, go ahead. Okay, one more. Um, the simple, what are the simple wraps that the wrapper, like, what makes an app simple versus complex for the wrapper? Um, well, right off the bat, I think it's um, stuff like authentication. Uh, we typically have the SDK handle any apps that require um, authentication. Um, and then uh, if there's a lot of scenarios with multi-identity where you can have a corporate identity that has access to the app and then you can also log in with personal identity, that affects the simplicity of the app. And then the save as restrictions. Um, um, so any, how, how, if your app has a document um, edits or creations and being able to manage those, I think that would be something that would benefit from being used with the SDK rather than the wrapper. Anything you'd like to add, Cal? OK, awesome. <laughs> All right. 
So um, before I dive into some things about Graph API, a couple of raise your hand questions. How many of you had the opportunity to see Yina uh, Arenas yesterday talk about Microsoft Graph and give some demos? It was at the, uh, the morning session. All right. Yina, um, Yina's with the Graph team, and, and she's got some fantastic demos. Unfortunately, mine are a little, uh, a little bit more, less, uh, a little less flashy. But uh, I'll definitely see if I can take, uh, take a couple of hers for some deep dive. But at least you have a, a, an idea about Microsoft Graph. Um, folks are familiar with the concept of Graph and what it's about. OK. So Microsoft Graph, at least from the Intune perspective, is the way in which you're going to access data and automate the Intune service via Graph's RESTful APIs. So as you're developing applications, and again, I'm going to flip a little bit from developing uh, end user or client applications over to developing applications which are primarily intended for IT pros or uh, your IT staff or maybe management staff for getting information out of Intune about how Intune is managing devices and data in a company. So rather than our client side apps, all of the data that is in Intune is accessible from a reporting and access perspective. And then for things that you can do in Intune, like for example, creating an app protection policy is one of the things that you can use the Graph API to automate. So uh, Graph API is our way to access and automate Intune service. The uh, graph.microsoft.com endpoint is the one endpoint where all of the Intune APIs that are used for doing this data access and automation are available. And I'll spend some time in Graph Explorer because that particular tool, although um, it's fairly straightforward in the types of things that you can do in it, is a really great way for you to understand the data that you have in Intune, how it's presented back to you, and uh, some basic things that you can do for automating Intune, at least on a one-by-one -one, uh, operation basis. So we'll spend a little bit of time in Graph Explorer as we get into the demos. Uh, everybody familiar with JSON? All right. So good example of uh, basic JSON text that's used in the context of a PowerShell script here where I'm defining some information about an Android store app. In this case, it's Microsoft Outlook, and there's some associated properties with this particular application. And for Microsoft Graph, once I have that, uh, that data defined for my particular object, I'm going to do a post against an endpoint, in this case, the mobile app uh, endpoint, and I'm going to present my uh, authentication header and to the specific URI, and that's going to go create for me this application. So I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time as well in demo, and we'll, we'll create and get some data, and we'll use not, uh, not apps, but we'll use some other well-formed uh, JSON data to demonstrate this as well. So since I, I was really impressed that uh, almost every one of you here are either using or are familiar with Intune, that's, that's really great. So, when you look at Intune, all of the items over on the left represent the types of objects that oftentimes our customers need to access and get information from or maybe create or automate. So app protection policies, as Aswari talked about, just the basic uh, information for how you want to protect your applications or the mobile applications themselves. When you're creating a mobile app, you could create a store app, you could create a line of business app, a web link, all of those types of applications represent data sources that you can access via graph, or you can automate the creation, edit, delete, assignment of those applications as well. Device actions is something that's a little bit probably more um, particular to help desk. So if your organization or the organization that you're developing applications for has a help desk, Oftentimes, the Intune console looks like, um, I'll, I'll say, kind of a big, scary console and has a lot of information that oftentimes IT doesn't want their help desk operators to be involved in. And so all of the device actions that are available for a mobile device, like just a simple one, such as Sync Now, go get the new policies, 
or reset the device or reboot the device or lock the device or maybe even start a remote assistance session. All of those actions are also available via graph. So what that means is that you can build a help desk application that reskins those particular actions and tailors it specific to the help desk for that particular organization. And that keeps your help desk operators out of the Intune console where they start to get nosy and they start digging into all of the different other Azure services and, and we know, you know it, it starts to kind of go downhill from there. You just want them focused on the five different tasks that they have available. So device actions are a really important aspect of things that you can automate for Intune. The rest of the ones there, um, fairly straightforward configuration policies, compliance policies, enrollment profiles, uh, role-based access control are the Intune roles themselves, all of those, as well as uh, auditing. I didn't put that up there, but all of the data that we audit is also available via Graph API. So then, over on the right-hand side, oftentimes, the scenario for developing automation requires that you get user information or device information out of Azure Active Directory. And if you recall, because Microsoft Graph also has things like mailbox information, SharePoint Online information, uh, supported by Yammer, supported by Teams, all of the data that's stored in all of those services can also be tied directly to the user who was using a device in Intune. So not only do you have just the Intune specific information, but you can gather a lot of data, analytics, and insights from Graph and tie those together in, in your application as well. So let's switch over to, uh, to go through a couple of different demos of some capabilities. And first I'll start with just a basic view of Intune. So I've got a tenant that I've logged into, and I've got 10 devices. They're all marked as compliant. And uh, let's go take a look at the equivalent of displaying some of this information by using Graph. So I'll go over to Graph Explorer, and I've authenticated as my uh, david at thundercreek.onmicrosoft.com. And I'm going to go grab a, uh, a little shortcut here so that I don't have to remember all these long URLs. We'll paste this in, and I'll run the query against Graph, and we'll take a look. If I can get the right keystrokes here. All right. So here's what Graph returned back to us by just asking for my device compliance policy setting state summary. It returns my unknown devices, uh, not applicable devices, and uh, there's a bunch of different categories down here for this particular API and the compliant device count of 10, in this case, are, uh, requires, uh, what is it, requires remain contact, shows that there are 10 compliant devices. And if we go back to the console, our 10 compliant devices is exactly the same data that we saw via graph. So the endpoint that the Azure portal is using to display this particular device compliance donut chart is exactly the same one that we ran in Graph Explorer. So that is to say that if you also pull up developer mode and you go uh, take a look at the network trace, and I can go back to, let's say, go back to take a look at uh, device enrollment, and we'll get a overview dashboard here as well. When I go run the device enrollment view and go take a look then in my network trace, I've got a graph call here for uh, test Intune enrollment slash device management and some additional OData filters and parameters for the data that was shown on the enrollment pane. So by using developer mode, you can easily tie together whatever you see in the console with the actual graph API call. And a lot of times when, when I have customers that come to me and, and they say, 
where's all the reference material for Intune, and I point them to the graph documentation. I've got a link in here for you. When I point them to the documentation and they open up the really, 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 really long list of all of the different Intune resources, it becomes really difficult to sift out, and, and I apologize, the, the table of contents in the documentation uh, could be a little bit better for search. Um, I know we're working on some documentation updates as well, but it becomes a real challenge to figure out exactly the specific information that you saw in the Azure portal when you go look in the reference material. So at least you have a good bridge. By now, uh, you can look up the specific item that's being queried by the console using developer mode. All right, so that's uh, first one of our first gets. Let's go take a look at Manage Device Overview. If I go to Graph Explorer and uh, we'll run Manage Device Overview, or uh, put it in the right place. And I sign in. All right. In the Manage Device Overview, if we take a look, I've got some counts by operating system. So I've got a summary set of data that's associated with each of the different operating systems that are enrolled in Intune. And if I go over to my Intune console and take a look under devices, we'll see the overview donut chart that shows enrolled devices by platform. So I have five Android, two iOS, one Windows, to Windows Mobile. And if I go back to Graph Explorer and take a look, um, that's exactly the same data count that I have here. So the reason why I'm walking through this particular flow is because everything that we do in Azure Portal for Intune goes through Graph, everything. So that is to say that when we go, uh, when I went back and I said access and automate Intune, it's exactly what the product team does for building our UI. We use Graph for accessing and automating everything in Intune. So that means that you, if you were ambitious, you could build a new UI for Intune. But realistically, you're going to build uh, special applications that isolate out key bits of information that you want to share either as part of an application or workflow or connectivity to other systems. All right, so depending on, depending on the audience, and I, I apologize if, if all of this is relatively obvious, but um, one of the things that you can do is add a select to the end of your OData query, and instead of getting a lot of details about each of the individual items, you can limit the, your list to just specific fields that you want to return. So if I were to run the same query, and here I'm looking at a list of managed devices where I have the device name and the user who enrolled it, if I were to eliminate that uh, select filter and run that query, then the data that I'm going to get back is quite lengthy for each individual device. So you're probably not going to want to return all of that data filter it out, you're probably just going to want to select the individual uh, fields. So OData filter for select, sort, picking the top 20, uh, selecting values, doing filtering, all of that is available via graph for all of the Intune APIs. One of the other, uh, one of the other aspects of Intune is because it's a management system, a lot of companies are really concerned about who did what. And the uh, Intune audit system will report back any change operation that occurred in Intune. So if a user logs in to the administrator console and deletes an application or assigns an application or creates a new one, then any of those change operations are audited and all of those audit events are also available via graph. So that means if you're interested in doing maybe a security event analysis to understand why the pin changed from four 
to six, and that policy got deployed to everybody, and now people started getting rather upset that they had to change their pin length. Um, you can quickly and easily understand from the audit system who exactly made that change. And the reason why I, I bring that up, I, I know that there are some other, um, some other systems that are out there where if you were to go, for example, take a look at, I'll go look at a device, sorry, I'll look at a device configuration policy. If we took a look at a profile, got an Android configuration device restriction profile. And if I look at the properties of this particular profile, one of the things that you don't see is who last changed it or who created it. So the audit information, which sometimes shows up on the object itself, isn't here. So it's a little bit difficult for you to go back into Intune and understand why a particular change was made or who made that change. So the audit system is your entry point into that. So audit data all available via graph. The next thing we'll take a look at is roles. So if I go back to Graph Explorer, let's take a look at uh, role definitions. In Intune, we have a, several built-in roles. And if I look uh, here, uh, sorry, this is still audit event data. If I look, I, I've got a policy and profile manager role, and I've got a list of all of the permissions that are associated with that particular role. So basic role information, accessible via graph, and if I go back to Azure portal, we take a look at all of the Intune roles. we'll see our policy and profile manager is one of the built-in roles here. So I can do a simple get in Azure portal and get a list of all of the roles. But if I simply change my get to a post and go grab some JSON text that defines a new role, put that in my request body and run that against the same endpoint Graph will now create for me a new role. So the same endpoint that I retrieve information, I can either patch or post against to create new objects or update existing objects. So now that I've created that new role, its display name is Graph Explorer role, and uh, the, the description is created in Graph Explorer. So if we just go back and do a refresh of our UI, we'll see that we now created our new custom role called Graph Explorer role. And the description is created in Graph Explorer. And if we go take a look at the permissions, eventually, I don't have my permissions. I didn't have that either today in the test portal. In your test portal, did you create a role? I was looking at the roles we had, and I was clicking on permissions. All right. Live site bug. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to go figure out what's up. Um, so assuming that my permissions are all there and just not being displayed, which I could actually verify if I go grab this particular role ID. Here's the ID that was assigned to it. And if I go back up and add that particular role ID, I can run the query and yeah, I need to get not a post. Thank you. So there's all my permissions. So they're still there. They're in the back end. So we probably have a UI issue. But I can also then do a uh, delete on that particular instance. And I got a 200 back. And so now I should be able to go refresh my list. And my Graph Explorer role is gone. 
So pretty simple end-to-end, -end, get a list, add a new item, delete an item out of, um, out of Intune. And that same principle applies for any of the different objects that you have in Intune, whether they be uh, mobile applications, policies, profiles, or what have you. One of the things that may be a little bit um, confusing from a programmability perspective is the fact that users and groups are listed here in the Intune console. And the users and groups extensions are actually from Azure AD. So if you launch users or groups, you've now gone directly into Azure Active Directory. And up at the top, we actually uh, report out that you're in Azure Active Directory. So if you're looking for the Intune users, you're not going to find them. They're actually Azure Active Directory users. From an administrative workflow perspective, we included those together with the rest of Intune so that um, our Intune administrators, who oftentimes do things with users and group, didn't have to navigate back over to Azure AD. All right, so any questions about Graph Explorer or the basics of being able to use uh, Graph with Intune? All right, let me go back and we'll talk about a few other important things. So a few things that are coming up with Graph and uh, Intune. How many of you guys want to spend a little bit of time in PowerShell? No PowerShell? OK. Um, if you're interested in PowerShell, you can, you can come to the, uh, the booth in the expo, and we've got some uh, PowerShell sample scripts. They're also referenced here in the, in the help uh, material for this particular session. But one of the things that we don't have today is a native PowerShell module for Intune. So uh, we're in the process of building one, and that'll be available directly from the PowerShell gallery. So you'll be able to install module Intune, whatever the name uh, ends up being. And all of the create, read, update, delete, assign operations, all your basic operations are going to be part of that first release. There's a few more complicated workflows that we'll uh, be building out and adding over the next couple of months and through the remainder of this year. But the first set will be out in the, first couple, in the next couple of months. You may have noticed that our graph APIs uh, were in beta for quite a long time, uh, s somewhere around six to nine months. They had all remained in preview. And uh, at the beginning of the year, we GA'd a large set of our APIs. And so month over month, there'll be new APIs that transition out of beta into GA or out of preview into GA. The best place to understand what has transitioned is to go take a look at the change log for graph. That change log is on the main graph page and includes changes for all services in graph, not just Intune. And then uh, even though we used Graph Explorer and it's a, it's a great little one-off tool, one of the things that we'll be putting in are some samples into Graph Explorer so that the tenant, the basic tenant that you use without logging into Graph Explorer will actually have Intune in behind it and you'll be able to make a, a whole bunch of different Intune calls as well. So that's work in progress. The last thing that I'll say is on user voice, this is a place if you haven't uh, had the opportunity to go take a look, user voice is where we collect a lot of information from our customers about what it is that they want to see changed in Intune. There are many different pipelines into the Intune team, but on a monthly basis, as we do all of our sprint planning, we'll go look at the list of changes that have happened in user voice, which things are ticking up, which things are ticking down, and what are our highest interest uh, features that are listed in user voice, and we'll include that in our Intune uh, monthly sprint planning process. So I would encourage you to put your requests out in there because those are directly heard by the engineering team on a, uh, during our planning process. So if you're developing against Microsoft Graph and Intune, there's a couple of, ed I'll, they're kind of good to know, kind of gotchas, depending on, on um, whether or not you've been frustrated with some of these things. But for any application that you, de uh, you develop, a global administrator is going to have to consent your app to run in their tenant. And um, this is one thing that oftentimes when a customer is new to application development with Azure and Intune, they have the mistaken belief 
that a global administrator needs to run the app. In other words, they think that somebody who's a global administrator needs to log into that application that you've developed, and they need to be the one running the application, which is not true. I know you guys get that, but that's one point that oftentimes um, is a value to share with your customers as you're developing apps, or if you're internally developing applications for your organization, you'll need to talk to whomever is a global administrator and get consent for your application to run in the tenant. The next thing is you've got to have a set of proper permission scopes for your application. And of course, I would recommend that you use the minimum set of permission scopes. And if you look in uh, enterprise applications when you're granting API permissions, as you're registering your application, there's a whole set of them for Intune, for all of the different major resources. And right now, all of those are categorized in two groups, read-only and read-write. So if you need to make any changes, you'll need the read-write permission scope. If you're just doing read-only operations, use read-only. Delegated versus app-only permissions. All of the Intune APIs today require delegated access. And uh, that means that one way or another, you're going to need to account for the fact that an interactive logged on user is going to need to present a token for that graph API call. Now, I realize that that isn't ideal. And so one of the things that we've got under investigation right now is how do we support app only permissions to access graph? So rather than allowing a uh, interactive logged on user credentials to come along with your application for delegated access, we're looking at app only permissions. If you, if you have scenarios around app only permissions, I'd love to hear them because as I'm gathering all of the requirements and the use cases, it, it really helps for our internal team to understand the breadth of different scenarios that you want to be able to use to access Intune from app only perspective. Paging. We didn't talk about paging as I went through some samples, but several Intune customers have over 100,000 managed devices. Several of them have thousands of applications that they've either brought in from stores or in, in certain cases, they've developed over 3,500 internal line of business applications, which is a lot, and they've put them all in Intune. But what it really means for you as a developer is that you need to consider whenever you're returning lists of information that you're going to, you're going to come up against a thousand uh, instance limit per page. And so uh, you'll either need to use next link or skip tokens to be able to get to the next set of data that's paged out of graph. So that's one of the, that's one of the gotchas that oftentimes when I see people first getting started with graph, they'll run a query and they'll say, where's all the rest of my data? I, I, <laughs> I went against managed devices and somehow we lost 4,532 devices because I had 5,432 yesterday and I only got 1,000 back. So paging is something that you're going to need to uh, consider as you're developing your applications. Because we're using delegated, any of the authenticated user that's making a call to Graph needs to have an Intune license associated with it. Just a requirement, but it's one that oftentimes trips people up because you'll get a forbidden message back from Graph, and uh, that forbidden message will oftentimes lead you down uh, a uh, access denied or a permissions type of troubleshooting path when in fact it's just the fact that there's not an Intune license associated with the user that's authenticated from your graph call. And we covered a little bit about auditing, but auditing is automatic for any change operation. So you don't need to make a specific API call if you want to ensure that any of the app actions that you're performing through Intune get audited. Our auditing layer is underneath graph, so any calls into graph automatically are automated, uh, audited for change operations. And lastly, Intune roles. So Intune roles are also honored below the graph layer. Even though you need to use permission scopes for your applications and ensure that you've got those granted for your application, when you, log, when you present a authenticated user to graph, that authenticated user can be either an Intune service administrator and have full permissions to do all things in Intune they could be a global administrator, but that's not the best idea. So if they're an Intune RBAC 
role user, then you can very specifically limit the, specific, the actions that that particular logged in user can perform. And RBAC will enforce that. So for example, let's say that the authenticated user was a member of the policy and profile built-in role. That policy and profile manager role does not have the ability to create new applications. But if your app went to go create a new app and the user who was authenticated was a member of policy and profile, you'll get a, you'll get a 403 returned back to you because Intune RBAC has said that user doesn't have permissions to perform that operation. So you need to account for that as well. And one of the reasons why I showed the ability to create a Intune role, a custom Intune role, is now you know what you need to know in order to create a role that has only the specific permissions for your application to run. So maybe in the initialization or setup code for your application, one of the things you can do is you can go create what will eventually become a well-known Intune role for you as your application that has only the minimum number of permissions. And that's always good to socialize with the security department or your IT department. Hey, here's my application. I've ensured that it has minimum permissions to go perform only the operations that are uh, required. That also means that Intune scopes are applicable for your application as well. And an Intune scope limits who you can perform those actions against. So if we go back to our help desk operation, a help desk sample, you remember I said that you could perform a, a remote task like a sync. Well, another remote task is actually a factory reset. And that's a fairly impactful event for an end user to have a device uh, reset on them. Now maybe it's something that your application wants to do, but maybe IT says, no, 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 you can't do wipes. So you can create a role and you can guarantee that through scope, that particular um, role can't wipe any of the user's devices because users are not included in the scope for that particular role. So you can leverage Intune RBAC to really help build out the security story for your application as well. We talked about data access, and one of the core scenarios that a lot of IT departments want to use Graph for is reporting. And there are actually two different data stores that we have Intune information in that people need to report out of. One of them is the operational store, and that's everything that I've been demonstrating with Graph today. The operational store contains all of your managed devices and application and the current status of enrollment of those devices or deployment of those applications. But on a daily basis, Intune will take a snapshot of some key information and roll that over into a data warehouse. It'll also flatten all of that data in the data warehouse and provide a, a much more effective and uh, I'll say streamlined and fast data retrieval of that information out of the data warehouse. The primary purpose of the data warehouse is really for trending and long-term analysis of what's been happening in Intune. So rather than knowing what happens what happened today or what happened the last with the last operation where you'd get out of the operational store, trending and analysis is going to come out of the data warehouse. And that actually is a separate API. So if you haven't had the opportunity to take a look at where to configure that, if I go back to my Intune console and go to my overview, over here on the far right is set up Intune Data Warehouse. And when you click that, you get a couple of things which are helpful to get you started. One of them is you get the URL. So I mentioned the Data Warehouse API. That's the endpoint that you want to be able to connect to to get your Data Warehouse information. And then we also have a sample Power BI file that you can download that has a bunch of pre-populated reports for you. So you can understand exactly what the back end looks like in the data warehouse that's all represented in that Power BI module. And uh, you can just run that against your current tenant. So it's really intended to be a simple, easy way for you to understand exactly what Power BI and the data warehouse can offer from a reporting perspective. All right. The last thing that I want to do is 
share with you some other things that are possible. And these are the result of specific conversations with customers that our product team has had about how they want to leverage graph. And so you may, you may find your particular use is in this list, but there are others that hopefully this will help you spark a little bit of imagination of other ways that you can develop applications against Intune. We talked about help desk operators, and there really are a lot of scenarios around tailoring a help desk operator application just to your specific uh, company's business process. And that can also be tying to other workflow systems because I know a lot of ticketing systems, uh, we don't have ticketing in Intune and that's oftentimes a really important aspect. So not just being able to track and manage tickets, but within that ticketing system, you can just call Intune APIs to perform uh, help desk operations. When customers uh, purchase and approve applications, we have no app approval or workflow in Intune for that. So if an end user requests some particular application, which may be a fairly expensive application, could be um, a Windows application that costs several hundred dollars, oftentimes that needs to go to a manager for approval and to the purchasing department. And all of that workflow really ends up wanting to loop back to the requester the deployment of the app. So the requester says, I'd really like AutoCAD, and that needs a bunch of approvals that goes through, finally gets paid, gets pushed into Intune automatically, then gets deployed to the user's desktop who had initially requested it. All that workflow can be coordinated and the, the end result, which is the user gets the application, can all be coordinated through Graph. As well, line of business application development, there's a lot of uh, customers who want to be able to deploy to a proof of concept environment to do their testing and validation. They don't want to deploy to the production environment, but at the point in time that the application is working and ready and everything is good to go, you do want to ensure that exactly the application and all the metadata that you tested and validated gets pushed into production. And it's, it's I'll say, essentially trivial to export out all of the JSON for that particular application that you did the testing and validation and then just go create that back in Intune in your production tenant. Human resource applications oftentimes need to manage the employee onboarding and offboarding process. And when that relates to a user's device, you wanna ensure that that device is wiped and no corporate data is on that. So you may have HR folks who have no idea whatsoever about an Intune Azure portal, and you probably wouldn't want them going to the Intune Azure portal, but you do want to say the employee is, is now left the company, and the result is that Intune calls out and issues a remote wipe of all of the company data from all of the devices that they had enrolled. And from DevOps perspective, there's, um, again, migrating from uh, proof of concept to production environments, doing your testing and validation, uh, that, that happens very easily and can be coordinated through graph or doing ad hoc reporting. Archiving is another business process that Intune doesn't offer the ability, but it's very easy to export out and you can export out as a CSV file, all of the data that defined all of your configuration and compliance policies and just store them off in an archived format, or connect to a SIEM system for alerting, monitoring, or other operations. So I promised you a couple of resources. If you want to take a screenshot of this or you know, get a copy of the, the PowerPoint from the build site that will contain all of these links. I didn't cover the PowerShell Intune samples, but the Intune samples that are there are intended to give you your basic create, read, update, delete operations for all of the primary Intune resources. But there's one key one that you're going to want to take a look at, which is line of business application upload. That particular process right now has code which is essentially baked into the Intune Azure portal and is not exposed via graph. So that PowerShell script goes through the requirements for creating a um, SAS URI to upload to, shows you how to do the encryption of your file and how to upload in chunks all of the application that you need to uh, get your 
line of business application into Intune. So if you're trying to automate the process of app creation, that line of business will cover Android, iOS, and MSI files for line of business upload. All right. And now you get the, the uh, please do your evaluation. So we've got uh, a couple of minutes left. I'll open the floor if there's any questions on either the graph side or any other questions that came up for Kyle and Aswari. I have yeah. a DevOps question. So basically, you guys make a lot of really amazing tools. I look at VSTS as a pretty amazing product. Mm -hmm. I look at Dev Center, or you know, they call it App Center now. Mm -hmm. um, why isn't there a build step in VSTS that automatically pushes my apps for Android and iOS to into, then automatically a build step that pushes that to Dev Center, so Dev Center automatically kicks off my tests. The atom actually goes into App Center, downloads Intune, downloads my app, runs my unit tests against it, and reports back what's going on. Because you, you guys own all right. these products, right? And the whole thing is, I, I get the PowerShell thing, but a lot of times in iOS, you have to run that on a, a Mac, because that's how you build applications. Mm -hmm. Those sure. PowerShell scripts, a lot of times, don't work without massive modifications. Yep. And so I would just like to see like better integration between like VSTS, because that's what every developer wants to use, right? It's yeah. really great. We really want to use App Center. We really want to use Intune, but we want a complete experience from Microsoft that just gives us a turnkey solution. Yep. Versus paint, cut and pasting a, a massive amount of stuff to try to keep everything connected together. You don't want to be the glue. You want. I don't want to be the glue. I I just want to write apps. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, it's a timely question. I've had some conversations in the last two weeks with the App Center folks. And so we're, we're in the process of figuring out what the end-to-end -end workflow is so that we can do that App Center integration. So that, and, and you're not alone in wanting to do all of this. Um, I, I've had several customers, and that's why I had that particular item on there for the app development. Um, customers really want to be able to just automate this. One of the key requirements is app-only permissions, because if you really want your service to service, to handle all of that connectivity and go do everything. So that's one of my, um, one of my prerequisites and I gotta get that piece done. But rest assured, I'm talking with those folks and, and we're working on that particular problem as well. All right, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you were talking about a new UI for Intune uh, as one of the uh, things that uh, you, uh, Graph allows you to do. Yep. Um, what about a new UI for company? Uh, so meaning like bringing graph to the IWS services that are called from the company as well. Is that something you have to work out? Okay. Um, so your question is would we be able to bring graph to the company portal or would we be able to reskin company portal? Not necessarily, not necessarily reskin, but basically like those right now those IWS services that are being call, uh, called from company portal. Oh, right? expose the IW services through graph. Yeah. We don't have any plans for that right now. Um, but what I would say is if there's specific use cases that you have where you want to call the IW service, like if you want to get a list of apps for a particular user or you want to get the featured apps or you want to get the company branding information or the IT contact information, if, if there's specific things that you're interested in, add those in user voice so that we have a record of what it is that you want to make available. Right now, Company Portal is the only uh, entry point for the IW service. And, and right now, I'm not aware of any plans that we have to make that either publicly available via graph or publicly available as a documented endpoint. Like one obvious use case is uh, like Amazon lets you push to Kindle devices right from one portal. So if I'm logged in on one device and I want to push an app to another device, that'd be really cool. Okay, so that particular use case where I'm logged on the company portal on my iPhone and I want to push it over to uh, maybe my, my desktop while I'm away from the office and so that it's there, um, that wouldn't necessarily require us to make the APIs public, but that's a great use case and I'd, I think that's another separate one that would be great to um, get recorded. All right, anyone else? All right, thank you so much for your time. I hope this was incredibly valuable and love to see your applications as you develop them. Come find us, show us.